For over 20 years, people laughed at him. They called him a madman. They questioned his integrity. They questioned his abilities. They questioned his credibilities. They made it very difficult for him to explain why he was doing what he was doing. They wouldn't believe that he could start three private museums in a span of five years, which got immediate international attention. Dear friends, there's a saying in Konkani, Kombiak, Pantia Pondar Dhamplyar, to Kokre Patsu Bon Zaina. Which means, if you try to cover a full grown male fowl under a basket, he does not stop crowing at dawn. That was the case with the madman. However much people try to put him down, call him words, names, whatever. He continued being focused to achieve what he wanted to achieve. My name is Victor Hugo Gomes. Not the Victor Hugo that you all know. The original Victor who wrote Les Miserables. But this is the Victor Hugo, that madman, who lived a miserable life most of the time. And I am here before you to tell you about my journey of why it is important to preserve the past for posterity. I have a pot here. I would relate my entire talk based on ancestral wisdom and seeking answers through their wisdom. This pot, there's a saying that goes with it. Burkulan na tandur, shit randul, which means there's not even a grain in the pot, and that woman is thinking of dreaming of cooking rice. Same in my case, I don't have a grain here. But I have this entire pot filled with ancestral wisdom. Be Toshen's bath. You rip what you sow. And this seed was sown in me as a child, waiting to be germinated. My growing up years was with my grandmother. My grandmother was blind. She could not see, she could not read. She could not write. She wasn't educated. She had not even been 30 kilometers from the radius of her house. Whenever she wanted to tell me a story, she would tell me about her life, what she did, what she saw. She was a very good narrator. She would create a visual of a land that she and I was born to, a beautiful place called Goa, lined with coconut trees, well-planned farmlands, lands that were kept for grazing, Land that was kept for housing, beautiful water bodies. And together with the water bodies, she had told me one story which I remember even today. She spoke to me about Rakandar. Rakandar is supposed to be the caretaker of the land, the ancestral spirit that takes care of the land. And she told me that the waterways is the pathway of the Rakandar. Do not mess around with it. I didn't know why she was telling me this. Probably. She wanted to shut me with the thousand questions I, that I would have for her. Probably she saw something that only a blind person could see, hoping that I would respect the land that was impregnated with the blood, sweat, and tears of our ancestor. Dear friends, when I was growing up, whatever stories that were told to me by my grandmother were changing. I saw the very fields where I played being turned into housing. It was very difficult for me to accept that change. The stories were slowly fading away, and my generation had jumped from fishing net to internet. At that time, I used to collect things from attic storerooms of our family, relatives, and dump it in my grandmother's room after her death, which I had made as my own room. At that time, I didn't understand that I could do something about it. Till I went to Lucknow as one of the seven artists from all over India selected for the national scholarship. I saw something that was very shocking for me and not acceptable. The beautiful objects and antiquities of the Nawab culture, Lucknow, a place which is known for its beautiful evenings, was sold on the streets of Lucknow twice a week. There were antique markets twice a week. Even more shocking was that these objects were sold to strangers to whom this object wouldn't have any relevance. They were sure objects for investment or uh, a lifestyle culture. 
At that time, a saying came to my mind, Dantyar Boslyar Ovyo Susta, which means whenever you sit on a stone grinder, all stories, all songs come to your mind. And my grandmother's words kept on coming, kept on coming to my mind. And that's what made me come back to Goa. I had the opportunity to come and set up the Christian art music. So I was in Goa, hoping that things were different here, but things were worse when I came to Goa. Antiques were sold in the Mapsa market. More and more antique shops were cropping up all over the place, again sold to strangers. But most importantly, the story of this land was getting destroyed. So at that time, I decided, OK, let me say whatever I can of what is left of Goa. I started going to remote villages, trying to collect whatever I can. But there again, there were shocking stories where they told me a couple of years ago, big vehicles came, took whatever that was usable, and it has left the borders of Goa. And at that time, I started collecting whatever I could, which was like cast away, which was not usable, broken, which was considered as firewood, take it home, restore it, and keep it aside. I never had a dream of setting up a museum. I only wanted to collect whatever that belonged to Goa. I wanted to only save whatever that belonged to Goa. There's a saying in Konkani, Dorian asa maso, mol ko tapiso, which means the fish is out in the sea, whereas the one who values it is a madman. Yes, I was that madman. I didn't have a rupee in my pocket, but I was dreaming of buying everything. I wanted to save everything. I used to beg, borrow money from people to buy things. I jumped different professions, from advertising to working as a waiter, to running restaurants, doing event management. Whatever money that I could collect, I used to go buy these things. Many a times, I used to give whatever money I had and tell them, I'll come back with the balance money and take away the objects. And till date, I've not managed to collect most of them. As I was going around, documenting, I, I'm a painter. I don't come from the background of uh, you know, documenting. That was the time when I started my serious documentation. I decided to document my coastal village of Benauli, where I was born. So there was this old fisherman who told me in Konkani, Baba, kashti bude nastana nustya mena. Which means, without dipping your loin cloth, you can't catch fish. And that's what I realized when I was studying in Goa. That was what was being taught to me. You know, book information. So whenever I went to a historian or an agriculturist, they would only give me books or references, which was just half the information. I'll tell you why. We consider the banyan tree as a religious tree, right? I have this implement. This is the only implement, the yoke, that touches the body of an animal. Rest of the implements are attached to this. Be it a harrow, be it a planer, be it a plow, be it a bullock cart. They could have used teak wood. Teak wood was easily available in Goa. They used banyan tree wood. The yoke is made from banyan tree wood. What does that tell you? That our ancestors were very sensitive to the animals. Secondly, they were well informed. Tick, the character of tick, it's heaty. It would give blisters on necks of animals. Whereas the banyan tree wood is light, soft, and cool. It wouldn't harm the animal. Like this, they designed different implements. Even the harness that was developed was made from kiwan or kumboi, bark of a tree, which again was cooling, it wouldn't harm the animal. Whatever they designed was meant to go back to the soil, was meant to recycle. Today, we have replaced that same implement with this nylon rope. I have another implement, okay, which is known as kondul. As a child, whenever we used to help fishermen push a canoe or pull a net, at the end of it, they would give us a little bit of fish. In seconds, they used to weave a basket like this called kondul. We would take this home, it would go back to the soil. Today, we have replaced this with plastic. Our ancestors had an amazing connection with nature. They knew how to relate to animals. For them, animals and the environment meant everything. I have a couple of implements here. This is a bell called gargadi. 
This slot that you see is not a defect or a mistake. It's not a natural crack. It's carved out for the farmer to put a stick and tune it so that he could identify the movements of the animals. There's a saying in Konkani, Shendlelea boilache rakandarache kanar ganto vazot rauta. Yes, that was the time my madness started. I was totally obsessed. Every time I heard that there's an object found or sighted, I would leave everything and run to that place hoping that that object would complete my story, hoping that that is one of the objects that I do not have in my collection. On one of those trips, I met this community called the Dhangar community. They go with hundreds of animals in the forests. They are goats. How do you think they get their animals back at six in the evening? This is the very implement okay, that was used by uh, farmers to stand in one place, play this flute, okay, and all the animals will be drawn towards the sound. It's known as surpava. Our ancestors were amazing engineers. Look at our frying pan that we use today. The pan is heavier than the handle. Whereas our ancestors had developed serving bowls with a cantilever, the weight was well divided so that there wouldn't be stress on your hand. Our ancestors were amazing recyclers. There was no question of how they wanted to get rid of garbage. They were people who never created garbage. Whatever they created, they recycle. Here you can see a shoe of a plow, which is used after the uh, plowshare was worn out, they used it as a coconut grater. That's how wise our ancestors were. Dear friends, why am I doing this? What am I trying to do with what I'm doing? Why are these implements important? All my museums are like old age homes. I can only prolong the life of these objects. They eventually have to die. They're all made from natural material. But what is very important for us is to save the trade, the makers of these tools, so that more copies or replicas could be made using the same wisdom, same know-how, and same material, so that that can last for another 200 years. Why did I set up museum of day-to-day -day utility things today? Because today, these objects are of relevance. The makers and users of these tools, some of them are still alive so that the story is complete, to tell their story. 100 years from now, new curators, new researchers, new scholars, youngsters who want to know about their past, they'll be able to get a totally unadulterated story or complete narrative. That's not the only reason why. These implements talk to us about our roots, how our ancestors planned and developed the land. We must remember, that we are borrowing the world and the reserves from the future generation. We must remember that we share this planet with other living beings. Our ancestors knew that. They respected it. It is not about shunning away the past and moving ahead. It's about being connected. There's another phase to development or progress. Progress that learns from the past and evolves the needs for the future. As individuals, we should not leave a permanent scar on this planet. Instead, we should create things that go back to the soil. For us, as curators or collectors of antiquity, our life is like a rubber band. It's, it can stretch to a limit, then it snaps. But what is very important for us today is to be answerable. Answerable to our grandchild. If our grandchild questions us someday, hey, grandpa, what have you left us with? I owe them an answer. Thank you.